Good afternoon, ladies. It's Pastor Regina. First, I want to say thank you so much to Wendy for stepping up, taking over the class on Sunday nights when I'm not there. Um, I still want us to do our study in Ruth. I'm not sure if Wendy is doing that or if she's not. I did have a lot prepared on Ruth, too, that I was going to bring over the last couple weeks, and I haven't gotten it there. So I thought I would do it in this video, load it in the group, and you all could go back and watch it over and over and over, however you want to do it. Um, so I want us to open with prayer. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to bring this teaching, Lord. It wouldn't even be possible without your help. I thank you for your wisdom and your knowledge, your counsel that you bring to us as you teach us to be more like Jesus. Father, I thank you for each lady that takes the time to review these videos, to show up for the classes, to participate in the ways that they do at church. I thank you, Father, that they keep me and Cindy and our families lifted in prayer. I thank you, Lord, for each one. Father, bless them as no one else can do, and it's all for your praise and your glory and your honor. In Jesus name so we've been talking about Ruth the last time I was there we went through Ruth 1 and y'all I'm sorry if this video is fuzzy um, I'm actually doing it from my webcam instead of my camcorder and so I don't know is something with the quality or the program or I don't know but anyway it technology's not been my friend today but again, we were talking about Ruth 1. We went through Ruth 1. We went through it verse by verse by verse. So now we are looking at Ruth 2. In Ruth 2, we see that Ruth was a Moabite princess. And she was of very fine character. She became the great-grandmother of King David. Therefore, this puts her in the lineage of Jesus but she was dissatisfied with the idol worship of her own people. And when the opportunity arose, when God opened that door, she gladly gave up the privileges of royalty in her own land and accepted a life of poverty among people that she admired. So as I studied this and this come out, it, it made me think back to the rich young ruler and we find that story in Mark chapter 10. Um, <clears throat> and remember, he asked Jesus what he had to do to be saved. And Jesus told him, get rid of everything and follow me. Give it all up and follow me. But he was attached. He was attached to those possessions. Like my hands wrapped around this cup. And he couldn't do it. But we see... Many years before him, before this opportunity, we see Ruth, who tells Naomi, I'm going with you. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. I am going with you. Now, through that decision, we see and find in chapter 1, we're going to do a little background here, that Ruth was under the wings of God. In chapter 1 of Ruth, God's hand fell hard upon Naomi and her family. Uh, you remember there was a famine in Judah or Bethlehem. And so they made a move to Moab. She, Naomi experienced the death of her husband, the marriage of her two sons to foreign wives, which were not Israelites. And then she experienced the death of her sons it was like one blow after another she's just getting knocked about every which way she can so we see in uh, Ruth 1 13 and in 20 that Naomi says the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me and in fact she is so oppressed in her life that she can't even see any signs of hope as they start to appear. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've experienced that 
point where you can't even see a sign of hope. Or maybe you know someone that's there now. Listen, you're that hope. You're that voice of hope. You give them that hope. One thing's for certain. Naomi knows that there's a God. She knows that he's no respecter of persons, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. She knows that he is almighty and that he rules in the national and personal affairs of men. And she knows that he's dealt bitterly with her, that her life is tragic. <clears throat> but what she has forgotten is that in all of those bitter experiences, of, of the children of God. Let me read that again. What she's forgotten is that in all the bitter experiences of his children, God is plotting for their glory. See, he's not just trying to beat you down and press you down and smush you and throw you in the pit and forget about you. Jeremiah 29 11 says that he knows the plans that he has for you, not plans for your calamity, but plans for your welfare that offer you a future and a hope. Listen, y'all may hear the kids. Um, it's not quiet in our house, so I just hope that you can go through it. They bring joy to us. They are our, our signs of joy. So again, God's plotting for their glory. He was plotting for Naomi's glory. And if we would believe this and remember it, we would not be as blind as Naomi seemed to be when God begins to reveal his beautiful grace to us. There are sweet providence of God that are breaking through. Sweet providence, as well as bitter, comes to Naomi in chapter 1. God lifts the famine and opens a way for Naomi to go home. He gives her an amazingly devoted and loving daughter-in-law to accompany her. <coughs> Excuse me. And he preserves a kinsman of Naomi's husband who will someday marry Ruth and preserve Naomi's line. How wonderful is that? How miraculous is that? I talked a little this morning during the announcements about miracles. Listen, these miracles are here for us to see, for us to study, for us to recognize, so that we can recognize when he's working in our own lives. But at this time, Naomi can't see any of this. She's hurt. And at the end of the chapter, she says to the townspeople of Bethlehem, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has afflicted me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Ruth and bitter Naomi, remember, we hear about name changes in the Bible. Um, Jacob is sometimes called Jacob, but sometimes he's called Israel. God changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. Sarah from Sarai to Sarah when he put his breath there. But Naomi changed her own name. See, Naomi meant um, pleasant, but she changed her name to Morrow, which meant bitter. So she's asking him, why you want to call me Naomi? Why call me pleasant? He's brought this calamity upon me. Call me Morrow. Call me bitter. In chapter two, though, the mercy of God becomes so obvious that even Naomi will recognize it. There's no way to deny his grace. So let's begin. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set forth and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, 
who was of the family of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came to Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose maiden is this? And the servant, who was in charge of the reapers, answered him, It is the Moabite maiden who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Pray, let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my maidens. Let your eyes be upon the field which they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to molest you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and she said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and your mother and your native land, and you came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord recompense you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, You are most gracious to me, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not one of your maidservants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her parched grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she arose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also, pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an epoch of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. She showed her mother-in-law what she had gleaned, and she also brought out and gave out what food she had left over for, after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close to my servants till they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth her daughter-in-law, it is well, my daughter, that you go out with his maidens, lest in another field you be molested. So she kept close to the maidens of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now Boaz is a God-saturated man. He's the kind of man every woman needs to have in her life. See, in verses 1 through 7, we meet Boaz. We see the character of Ruth, and we sense a very merciful providence behind the scene. Boaz, we learn, is a relative of Elimelech, Naomi's long-deceased husband. And immediately, we realize that things are not nearly as bleak as Naomi has suggested back in verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. 
where she gave the impression that there was no one for Ruth or Orpah to marry to carry on the line of their husbands. For the person reading the story for the first time, Boaz is like a bright crack in a cloud of bitterness hanging over Naomi, and it's going to get bigger and bigger. For example, verse 1 says that he's a man of wealth. But more important than that, verse 4 shows that he is a man of God. Why else would the storyteller pause to record the way Boaz greeted his servants? And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. If you want to know a man's relationship with God, you need to find out how far God has saturated to the details of his everyday life. To his everyday life. How does he treat others? How does he greet others? Is he compassionate? Is he showing the love of God? See, evidently, Boaz was such a God-saturated man that his farming business and his relationship to his employees was shot through with God. He greeted them with God. And we will see in a minute that these women were more than pious platitudes. <gasps> Ruth is a woman of character. Besides meeting Boaz in verses 1 through 7, we see the character of Ruth, which is going to be very crucial in what this chapter intends to teach. That's my husband you hear, in case you were wondering. He's grilling for us. <laughs> so number one, Ruth's initiative was to care for uh, Naomi. First, we see Ruth's initiative to care for her mother-in-law. Now notice in verse 2, Naomi does not command Ruth to get out and work. Ruth says, let me go to the field and glean along the ears of the grain. Ruth has committed herself to Naomi with amazing devotion, and she takes the initiative upon herself to go work and to provide for her mother-in-law. Secondly, we see Ruth's humility. She knows how to take the initiative without being presumptuous. In verse 7, the servants report to Boaz how she had approached them that morning. She had said, Pray, let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. She does not demand a handout. She does not presume the right even to glean. All she wants to do is gather up the leftovers after the reapers are done. And she takes the time to ask permission to even do that. She is like another foreign woman who came to Jesus and said, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. To which Jesus responded to her by extolling her faith. Ruth knows how to take the initiative, but she is not pushy or presumptuous. She's meek and she's humble. Now, Ruth is also industrious. We see her industry. She's an amazing worker. Verse 7 continues with, She has continued from early morning until now without resting, even for a moment. She worked from early morning, and you know, by this time, it's, it's close to dinner time. It's almost quitting time. She hasn't taken a break. She's just worked and worked and worked. And verse 17 goes on to say that she gleaned until evening, and then before she quit, she beat out what she gleaned, she measured it, and she took it home to Naomi. So gleaning was work, then she had more work. She beat it out, she measured it, she carried it home to Naomi. So there's no doubt that the writer wants us to admire and copy Ruth in what she does. She takes the initiative to care for her destitute mother-in-law. She is humble and meek 
and she does not put herself forward presumptuously, and she works hard from sun up to sundown. She takes initiative, lowliness, industry, worthy traits, so keep your eyes open for them again. Now we see God's merciful providence. But before we leave verses 1 through 7, did you sense a merciful providence behind all of this? Notice that verse 3, so, so she set forth and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Hold one moment. Children, Aunt Gina's doing a video. Can you please be quiet? She happened to come. You don't have to write your theology in every line. Sometimes it's good to leave something ambiguous to give your reader a chance to fill in the blank if he called on. The answer can be given later. It will be, in fact. Naomi, with her grand theology of God's sovereignty, is the one who will give the answer. The answer is God. The merciful providence of God guiding Ruth as she gleans. Ruth happened to come to Boaz's field because God is gracious and sovereign even when he is silent. As Proverbs 16.9 says, A man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. So why has Ruth found favor? Now in verse 8 and 9, Boaz approaches Ruth and he shows her great kindness, even though she's a foreigner. And that's very important to point out, even though she's a foreigner. He provides food by telling her to work in his field and to stay close behind his maidens. He provides protection by telling the young men they better not touch her. They better not assault her in any way, shape, or form. And he provides for her thirst by telling her to drink from what the men have drawn from the well. So all of Boaz's wealth and godliness begin to turn for Ruth's welfare. He, he, she's found favor in his eyes. Now we come to the most important interchange, verses, uh, verses 10 through 13. Ruth raises a question which turns out to be very profound, and it's one that we all need to ask God. Hardly anything in our life is more important than the answer that we get. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor? in your eyes, that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner. Ruth knows that she's a Moabitess. From a natural viewpoint, she has two strikes against her. She does not resent this, but accepts it. As a non-Israelite, she does not expect any kind of special treatment. Her response to Boaz's kindness is astonishment. She can't believe that she's found favor in his eyes. She doesn't understand it. She knows that she came from a foreign land with pagan gods. She's very different from most people today. We expect kindness and are astonished and resentful when we don't get our rights. But Ruth Ruth expresses her sense of unworthiness by falling on her face, by bowing to the ground. Proud people don't say thanks. Humble people are made even more humble by, by being treated graciously. Grace is not intended to lift us up out of low, lowliness. It's intended to make us happy in God. It's not on the basis of merit, but we're obviously getting ahead of ourselves. Ruth asked Boaz, why has he treated her so graciously? And verses 11 and 12 are crucial. Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. 
and how you left your father and your mother and your native land, and you came to a people that you've never known before. The Lord recompense you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. She's taken refuge under the wings of God. Now notice, when Ruth asks why she is being shown grace, Boaz does not answer, grace has no conditions. He answers her question, why? By saying, because you have loved Naomi so much that you were willing to leave everything you knew. You were willing to leave your wealth, your family, your security to come to a land where you know no one, you're a stranger, and take care of your mother-in-law. So does this mean that the writer wants us to think of Ruth's love for Naomi as a work that merits Boaz's favor and the favor of God? Does he want us to think of grace as a kindness that we earn? I don't think so. If Ruth has earned the favor of Boaz, then we must think of her as a kind of employee rendering service to Boaz, her employer, which is so valuable that he is indebted to repay her. But that's not the image the writer wants to create in our minds. Verse 12 gives, gives another image that makes the employer-employee image impossible. Because she sought refuge under God's wings. Boaz says in verse 12 that God is really the one who was rewarding Ruth for her love to Naomi. Boaz is only the instrument of God, as we will learn from Naomi in just a moment. But now notice the words. The Lord recompense for for, uh, recompense you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord the God of Israel under whose wings you come to take refuge this verse does not encourage us to picture Ruth as an employee of God providing needed labor which he then as an employer rewards with good wage <laughs> The picture is of God as a great winged eagle and Ruth as a threatened little eaglet coming to find safety under the eagle's wing. The implication of verse 12 is that God will reward Ruth because she has sought refuge under his wings. This is a common teaching in the Old Testament. For example, in Psalm 57.1, we find it written, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in thee my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of thy wings I will take refuge. Notice the word for. Be merciful to me, for in thee my soul takes refuge. Why should God show mercy to Ruth? For what reason? Because she has sought refuge under his wings. She has counted his protection better than the protection of anyone else. Better than the protection of her parents, of her siblings, of the great people in her country. She has set her heart on God for hope and for joy. And when a person does that, God's honor is at stake, and he'll be merciful. If you plead God's value as the source of your hope, <coughs> instead of pleading your value in the source of God's hope, then his unwavering commitment to his own value engages all of his heart for your protection and your joy. It's not when we put ourselves first and we say, look at me, look at what I've done. But Lord, look at what I've done. It's when we say, Lord, look at what you've done. Look at what you've done. You've covered me in your wing. You've protected me. You've done more for me than anyone could ever possibly do. 
She was seeking refuge in God, and she was loving others. Look at the love she bestowed upon Naomi, her mother-in-law. But we must ask how Ruth's love for Naomi and her leaving her own family relate to her seeking refuge under the wings of God. The most likely suggestion is that Ruth was able to leave the refuge of her father and her mother in Moab because she had found a refuge under the wings of God, which was far superior to anything she's ever experienced. Far superior. And evidently she saw a need in Naomi's life and sensed God calling her to meet that need, to not leave Naomi alone. The eagle moved toward Naomi, and in order to keep enjoying the refuge of God's wings, Ruth moves too, and she commits herself to care for Naomi with the care she is receiving from her eagle, from God. <coughs> Excuse me. So the relationship between taking refuge under God's wings on the one hand and leaving home to care for Naomi on the other hand is that being under God's wings enabled Ruth to forsake human refuge and give herself in love to Naomi. Or another way to say it is that leaving home and loving Naomi are the result and the evidence of taking refuge in God. So now back to Ruth's question in verse 10. Why have I found favor? The answer is that she has taken refuge under the wings of God and that this has given her freedom and desire to leave home and love Naomi. She has not earned mercy from God or from Boaz. She is not their employee. They are not paying her wages for her work. On the contrary, she has honored them by admitting her need for their work and simply taking refuge in their generosity. This is the message of the gospel in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God will have mercy on anyone, Palestinian or Israelite or American, who humbles himself like Ruth and takes refuge under the wings of God. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate. All the Pharisees had to do was take refuge under the wings of Jesus. That's it. Stop justifying themselves. Stop relying on themselves. Stop glorifying themselves. But they would not. But Ruth, Ruth was their model. No falling on their face before Jesus. No bowing down. Uh, excuse me, Ruth was not their model. She should have been, but they wouldn't follow her. So they did not fall on their face before Jesus as she did Boaz. They didn't bow down. They weren't astonished at his grace as Ruth was. So we can't be like the Pharisees. We must choose to be like Ruth. Be humble and gracious and kind and compassionate. God is not an employer looking for employees. He's not. He's an eagle looking for people who will take refuge under his wings. He is looking for people who will leave their father and their mother and their homeland or anything else, their riches, whatever may hold them back from a life of love under the wings of Jesus. So let's take a look now at Naomi's theology of God's sovereignty. Excuse me one moment. Let me end by getting back to Naomi briefly. Boaz gives Ruth all she can eat for lunch. Uh, that's more grace. More grace. Great grace. She works from 
or she works till sundown. She returns to Naomi and she gives her the leftovers from lunch and all the grain. She tells her what happened with Boaz. And in verse 20, Naomi's theology of God's sovereignty serves her well. She says, Blessed be he, Boaz, by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. I think the kindness she refers to is the Lord's kindness. Boaz had just begun to show kindness to the dead. It was good who seemed to, ha or excuse me, it was God who seemed to have forsaken it. The Lord's kindness has not forsaken the living, Naomi or Ruth, or the dead, the Limiac or Chilion. It was the Lord who stopped the famine. It was the Lord who bound Ruth to Naomi in love. It was the Lord who preserved Boaz for Ruth. Ruth did not just happen to come to Boaz's field. God directed her there. The light of God's love has finally broken through bright enough for Naomi to see. Naomi's able to recognize she's no longer blinded. She sees that the Lord is kind, that he is good to all who take refuge under his wings. So let us fall on our faces. Let us bow before the Lord, confess our unworthiness, take refuge under the wings of God, and be astonished by his grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this amazing group of women whose heart and desire is to seek you. Father, it is not our desire to lean into our own understanding, but in all of our ways to acknowledge you. Forgive us where we fall short, Lord. Guide us, lead us down the paths of righteousness for your name's sake, for your glory, for your honor. Lord, counsel us and help us as we meet others. Help us to be kind. Lord, there's a time when we need to be Ruth and we need to be humble. And there's a time when we need to be Boaz. And we need to be gracious and merciful, compassionate and giving. Teach us how to be each of these things for your glory and for your honor. Thank you for your wise counsel. Thank you for your leadership. But God, most importantly, thank you for your love. And tonight, we seek refuge under your wings. Cover us. Protect us with your mighty wings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.